In June 2005, Merchant Navy veterans from all over the UK visited Age Exchange in Blackheath to mark the end of Cruel Sea, a project about the Merchant Navy in World War II. These survivor stories have been recorded, featured in a touring exhibition of national and regional museums, and preserved in archive form. They wanted their stories to be more widely known and to be made available for future generations. Reunions like this serve a dual purpose. They provide an opportunity to recall the past, but also help those involved to get on with their lives, living each day to the full. This film will focus on four men's stories. Four men with very different experiences, but all linked by the sea, and all of them in the Merchant Navy during the Battle of the Atlantic in World War II. John Hipkin from Biker in Newcastle, Jack Brotheridge from Litherland in Liverpool, Len Dib Weston from Totterdown in Bristol, and Frank Holding from Everton in Liverpool. They were all just boys when they joined the Merchant Navy, no more than 14 or 15 years of age. The men were all born and brought up by the sea, within the sound of its call. I was born in Litherland in Chalcester Street, which was very close to the river and the docks. And of course, the sound of the ships was always with us. Barney's bull was the one that went when it was foggy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, my father was a seafarer, so the atmosphere of the sea was more or less in our family. So I come 14 years of age and had to find work. Well, I used to go down, first of all, I was riding a bike, delivering paints for the Walpamere in Liverpool. And uh, a lad there said to me, why don't you go down to the docks on the bike when you got spare time, get away to sea. And I went down and I got myself a job as a cabin boy on a ship called uh, Roberts Holt, Roberts L. Holt. Uh, used to run to West Africa. I joined there, and I, I joined there, and my pay then, I was a cabin boy, was £2.50 a month. At the end of December 1940, I decided it's about time to, to get a job, so I went off and found myself a shipping company that was short of a cabin boy, so they gave me a very cursory medical, one I shall never forget, where was, the doctor says, lift up your shirt, drop your trousers and cough, and, and that strange ritual meant that apparently I was fit for sea. <laughs> The routes into employment were traditionally either in the mines mm -hmm. or in the shipbuilding yards on the Tyne, so, but uh, I didn't fancy those at all and, and I wanted to see some of the world, so I very quickly got myself lined up with a shipping company, I had a, this medical and signed on and that was it. I joined the Lustrous and, uh, uh, at the mouth of the Tyne and we sailed up to Grangemouth for bunkering and uh, because I was just 14, everybody else seemed to go for the pubs, but I went to see a film with Jane Withers in. <laughs> I was born, some mother tells me, on uh, <laughs> 4th of October 1925 in um, South Bean Hospital, Bristol. I lived in Totterdown and then moved to Knoll. Uh, I first went to see it at the age of 15 and sailed right from the centre of Bristol uh, on the Norwegian ships. We sailed from Bristol. We were going to sail at 11 o'clock in the morning and leave Bristol Dock. So my mother was going to come down, my brother was not to see me off. So that we went at 10 o'clock, so I missed them. And uh, I was very seasick from here to Barry. And it was on a Sunday evening when we I sat under the lifeboat and I pulled in my sock and I was so, so homesick and I broke my heart, <laughs> cried. But um, anyway, got over that and uh, we went to sail to um, Milford Abe, I think it was first and up to Loch Uwe, and then across to Canada. She's only a small ship, and I think I was seasick for 15 days. I was really ill. 
and you'll be up at half past five in the morning for coffee down in the engine room at six o'clock and on the bridge. Jack's father had served in the Merchant Navy in both the Great War and the Spanish Civil War. When World War II started, he was sunk in two separate attacks, had his pay stopped immediately, was missing for two months, and then died in Bootle Hospital two days after his return. He was 46 years of age, and although eventually my mother did get something, it was put down as he died of a liver complaint, and it had nothing to do with the... So my mother, obviously, and I had to find work, you see. With the war starting, all building trades were stopped. So we were immediately laid off. Uh, Mr Glenn, my boss, I'm very sorry, but I can't keep you. So I wandered down to the docks, got a bit of work as a docker. But you only got four hours, I mean, unless she was very well known down there, you just wasn't in. And uh, yeah, you had to go into Liverpool to get the money and all that. And then a shipwright, Mr Spencer, uh, heard that I was a carpenter and took me in his gang. So I then was becoming a shipwright, you see. I was learning all about ships. My father used to say, um, if I could earn three pound a week, I'd be a happy man. He never made it. The war started abruptly for the Merchant Navy, a few hours after it had been declared, with the sinking of the unarmed passenger ship Athenia and the loss of 112 passengers and crew. 14-year-old John Hipkin was aboard the SS Lustrous when it met up in mid-Atlantic with the imposing German battleship, Scharnhorst. And uh, I was scrubbing the floor of the, the mess deck and, and the chief steward come and he, he said, go aft, son, and get your life jacket. And I thought, well, it's about time we had a, a boat drill. And as I went along the flying bridge, I could see the fighting top of a battleship on the horizon. And for some kids went for silhouettes of aircraft, I went for silhouettes of ships, and I was wondering which of our 15 battleships this one was. And in the cabin, I was putting on my life jacket on, and the, the shells, shelling started. <laughs> the convoy system was used to try to maintain Britain's supply line against deadly enemy submarines and ships. When you're on the wheel, this is where you see most of it, you know, you're there, you're catching up on the ship ahead or something like that, <coughs> falling back too far, and you see other ships, and sometimes it's the convoy changed course, maybe the other ship a bit late turning, you know, you're watching it all around you. But it's, uh, it's togetherness, isn't it? Attacks on the other side of the convoy, it could be six yeah. or eight miles away. You hear the banging and all that, but yeah. you don't really know what's going on. You don't, we never knew the numbers of our convoys, no, we never no, knew no, where no, we were no. going. It's only since the books we've had. Tell us all what's like going the on. first time I was really frightened, I was down in the pump room on, on the, on the Herbrand. All of a sudden a big bang, I thought we've been hit. Up oh, I went, but what it was was just step charges going off. <laughs> That's the people you had to admire, those yeah. down in the engine room. Yes, yes. They, no chance. They were right there, they never had no chance, mm -hmm. no. Mm -hmm. Losses were heavy and frequent. They had another ship called the Fist. Frank joined the SS Beatus in 1940. And Beatus means blessed. I remember that like. Oh, it must have been blessed me. <laughs> anyway. Come on home, we got done. Night, night time, moonlight nights. As I was afraid, always feared that moonlight night because you could look over the side and see this right across the ocean, a big white path, the moon. And we, I'd think there could be someone there watching the, you know, you, you couldn't see it. Anyway, we, we had the second ship to get it that night, it was after eight o'clock. And we took to the boats. On a secret mission to the mouth of the Danube, Jack took a few hours shore leave, only to find his ship wasn't where he'd left it. And it was like, like looking from the pierhead to New Brighton, right down the bottom of the Danube. There was a ship anchored. That was our ship. So we set off down the bank. But before long, we were up to our knees in water and reeds. We couldn't go much further. And I thought, well, if we go back, there's only one place we can go, and that's on the German ship. We're not going on that. We didn't know what to do, in other words, and I spotted the boat. And we seen a boat pulled up. So we got in it, and I said, let's get in the boat. And I'd had a little bit of experience with the rowing boat, and we pushed out into the Danube. We got carried away by the current. 
So there was ice and everything. I've got it all written there for you. And um, the boatswain, Di Davis, a Welsh chap, a good man, like, they'd watched us coming. And the point was to turn. We were going to whip past the game. So they paid ropes out with wife boys on. And fortunately, I managed to turn the boat and then row against the current. There was lumps of ice and everything coming down the river, terrible fast. And we grabbed one of these ropes and we got all back and dragged out the boat. And the boat was cut off and off and thrown in our bunks. <laughs> and, off. <laughs> and we got out the house of the Danube, you see. Len wears the white cap of the Arctic convoys. We were towed right through the White Sea by icebreakers, took a couple of days, just towing us through. We had a uh, man stood by with an axe to cut the tow ropes, and the cables coming through saying we were lashed round so they could be chopped away if we were attacked. And then we, we were red, arriving at um, Archangel at the river, and the people crossing, stopped the people crossing, so we went through, we looked back, and about five, ten minutes, the people were still going across the ice again then, all broken up. It's frozen so quick. They took us to Bakaritsa, broke up all the ice in the, in the dock. The soldiers there with big poles keeping the ice away and we got in and we were in solid within about 10 minutes, more than an hour, we were in solid. We stayed there for nearly three weeks, I mean, unloading. Or um, Russian prisoners it was unloading us. Guards everywhere. There was a guard in our mess room and they put a notice up. If we were caught bartering or associating with women, we could get five years in the salt mines. They told us that, and they, we follow, they follow us everywhere we went. In the dance hall, they'd get up and they'd read their news to all the people there. It's funny, really, because there's a little dance hall, and there's young girls outside with big rifles on guard, and you know, in the snow and everything else, and, and they had palm trees in there. It was wonderful, really. John Hipkin and the entire crew were taken captive by the German Navy. There was a, there was a, a propaganda film crew yeah. uh, on board the Sean Horse, and they were, they were filming... Uh, this was the first ship that did sink, so obviously they, they, this was propaganda for countries like Spain and, and Portugal, for instance. They dub, dub their propaganda films in the appropriate language and, and hope to get new allies that way. It was a way of showing the world that the German battleships could roam the Atlantic if they pleased. Now you're a boy of 14. Yeah. You're on your first trip and you've been sunk. And you were taken aboard this massive ship. How did you feel? I've always wanted to be on a battleship. <laughs> always. And, and I, I almost, with a, an armed guard, had the run of the ship for every day for about a week. And then at the end of this week, everybody, all the, all the crew of Illustrious, we had, were still just one ship had been sunk, uh, were taken up on, on the deck. And there I saw the Nice now, the sister ship of the Sean Horst. Wonderful transatlantic meeting, each of them with its respective supply ship, uh, which was busy unloading new stores for the two battleships. After his rescue, Frank returned to Liverpool in the Blitz. By them days, from Glasgow to Liverpool, it could take near 10 hours on the train. Well, I got back in Liverpool, there was an air raid on the next ship, down right down by the pier head, and I had to walk home about Good half mile or more. I could hear the strap was falling all around me, you know. And when I got home, the windows were blown out. And someone said, Your mother's under the chairs, because they used under the chairs of the shelter for the people in the area. I went down to see my mother and broke down, you know. Len returned to Bristol. You get amongst your, your old mates, high school mates, and that. You realise that you've matured at that much, you know. You've seen some things that they hadn't seen, though they've been in the blitz. We've been in the blitz ourselves, home here in Bristol at the age. And, uh, you matured and you had money to spend, so that made you feel great, sort of thing, you know. Mm. It's, a, it's a funny thing, is uh, oh, we're always proud to be Merchant Navy. All we have is our little Merchant Navy badge, you know. Mm. I think we showed off a bit with our money and uh, oh, drink, yes. drinking yeah. early. You American know, cigarettes sticking out your pocket. Yes, I, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, my, first, my first one, I trip, as I said, yeah. I went to Canada and I, I, had a, I bought a pair of. Uh, lumberjack boots, all laced up, beautiful, a big woolly um, and right sort of thing, you know, and uh, a set snap more type of American hat. Like I must have looked a right fool when I come home. They said I was dressed up there, do, uh, all dressed up, and all, uh, merchant navy badge. 
Frank's next voyage was also ill-fated. The SS Laconia was torpedoed and sunk, but the U-boat commander helped the survivors. In, in our lifeboat, we had the second officer, and he said, it's a thousand miles from land, but we can make it. Put the sail up. So we felt safe with him. But then later in the day, the U-boat coming down, told to put the sail down. He said, you won't make it. I've asked for people to come and pick you up, rescue you. Stay where you are. So we stayed there. But that night, decided again to make a move for us. But apparently, it never come about. The U-boat come again, put, took us in tow. He was, uh, and he, he told us to an area where he going to be a rendezvous when the uh, rescue ship would come and pick us up. Well, through the night, apparently, before we got to this rendezvous with him, they'd been attacked by an American airplane and he told us to be an aircraft then in the night to cut yourself adrift, because we had an hatchet in his boat. Cut yourself adrift, because I have to dive. And we've been told before, and that by our people, they used to dive and tow you under drownders, you know. But they were, it was decent with us, he gave us a bottle of wine, a tin, when it was bread brown, it was black bread they call it. I told us to stay where we were. The German army meted out very different treatment in the prison camps. Mm -hmm. The whole ship shook as she sped through the night and we came on deck one morning and we were in the port of La Police in, in occupied France yeah. and the Kriegsmarine, the German Navy, who'd been very kind to us, put us ashore there and the Wehrmacht took over and dead things started going quite nasty then because we were put into cattle trucks for the next 24 hours or so uh, it was impossible for everybody to lie down. There were fights breaking out among the Chinese crew during the middle of the night. It was a dreadful journey, that. And we ended up at um, Semedard en Jal, just outside Bordeaux, where the G French had built a huge German, uh, prison camp for German troops, but it was reversed now. It was our camp now. And saint Medard en Jal, this is French Salag 221. And there we were registered... Uh, we were, um, we had to take all our K-Park life jackets off and put them in a pile. Well, I didn't have much clothing. And during the night when it was cold, that K-Park jacket was, was warm. And I learned one of my first lessons of captivity. Rumours always abound. And most of them are totally wrong. A rumour went round that you could pick up your life jacket and bring it back. So I, I took the one off the top of that pile, put it on, and the next thing I knew, I was sprawling in the sand. I'd been struck in the back of the head. And when I looked up, there was a German officer uh, with his hand on his pistol and, and a guard who had his rifle around poking at me. And it, uh, it, was, it was such a transformation from the Kriegsmarine. Jack worked aboard the SS Flaminian, which after a series of accidents and mishaps, was talked of as being jinxed. And then we got up to lock you. Laying lock you. And while we were there, a, life, a, a motorboat came out to us with a young boy on it. And um, he was going to be a cadet. And uh, he came on board, and the captain met him and showed him where he was sleeping. And he said, Get your change your clothes now. I'm going up the boats to the garden. Uh, we're loading the lifeboats up and getting everything filled in, you know, make sure all the water tanks were full and the stop was in and all that. And this boy put his foot on the, on, the, on the gunnel of the lifeboat to hand over and slipped and fell down the side of the ship. And unbeknownst to us, there was a water tender just coming alongside and he hit it. And, and a chap named MacArdle, I think MacArdle's still alive, he's from the north, jumped in, to, dived into the sea and grabbed him. And he was dead. So the captain said, my God, he said, he's only been here an hour and we've got, to, we've got to get in touch with his parents and he's dead. So that was the first thing. And that was, it was, somebody said, there's a jinx on, on this ship. Anyway, we jumped at. That was the first death. Far away from the war at sea, 
John was transferred to Stalag 10B. We arrived in Germany and because we were near the fish and the fowl, merchant seamen, we were civilians, we weren't even armed personnel. Uh, and uh, you take Germans, take British soldiers from Dunkirk and you put them in a soldier's camp, which is a Stalag. But the, what do you do with seamen? You only capture them in penny packets, more or less. So there wasn't the merchant seamen's camp. So this put us into a, a Stalag 10B. It's San Bostel, a prison camp with 30,000 men in it. And of all uniforms, all armies, and the, there was the most horrendous prison camp, a concentration camp section, which um, was there right until the bitter end. We were transferred after about six months, but Yugoslav prisoners came into that camp from every newly occupied country had its quota. And we were in Stalag 10B, we were beginning to receive Red Cross food parcels every one a week, which meant that you were not starving any longer. You were still hungry, but you had wonderful things to eat and, and w w the Buckets of soup, fish soup, sauerkraut soup, which we used to pick up from the from the, the the camp kitchen and bring to our own. We didn't need that so much, and we, as we had to go through the Yugoslav compound into the French compound, the French were obviously cooking the soup for us. Uh, we would pick up our bowl of our buckets of sauerkraut soup, and they'd grown up a custom. We had Red Cross food parcels. We were just hungry, not starving. It's a big difference. Yugoslav soldiers were the lowest of the low in the hierarchy of races at that time. And they used to hang about with the Dixies. And we'd a development, a customer developed that they could dip their Dixies into and and uh, w walk away with whatever soup was soup of the day. And the god that day we had a must have been a new god. He didn't like what he saw. And the Yugoslav soldier had dipped his Dixie in the bucket three buckets ahead of me uh, and was walking away when the guard shouted at him and he panicked and the guard lifted up his Do you my foot was shot him. Jack's jinx chip now hit a storm in the Bermuda Triangle. The Bolson seen it coming. We were called to the bridge and he said you can get everything secured because it's bad weather coming. And um, the boatswain said, here it is, coming, there was a white line. And when it hit us, we were three days and three nights, and we had to fire a rocket to the poop because the steering gear got jammed, the flying bridge had collapsed, and we put it into hand gear, and um, we'd lost the chief, like. And the, the Americans reckoned that there was only four waves to the mile in that storm. I mean, you, could, you just couldn't see over them. I'm not joking, I've never I've seen anything since or before. You went down and up. And apparently, what I was told after that, the waves gradually, the fall part of the wave gradually becomes vertical. And if you hit one that was vertical and what was up there fell on you, you would, but it didn't happen anyway. And we got into Bermuda and we got patched up and rail straightened and everything else, and then we set off again for uh, New York. Frank became a prisoner of war in Casablanca, where he learned the fate of his friends on the Laconia. I worked in the, in the galley aft, and the farmer were aft, and this fellow used to go, a fellow called uh, Jimmy Edesty. Jimmy Edesty, a big fella, we, he was a fridge greaser in the engine crowd. I used to give him a cup of tea from the you know, sea, you know, give him a cup of tea. So I said, what happened to Jimmy Edesty? Someone said to me, oh, he went down, he said, there John was in the lifeboat, and Jimmy was saying, John, don't leave me. I said, John got out the boat and went back to his brother. I said, that brother, he'd love for you. You know, sad. Okay. Yeah. Both went down. Yeah. Sorry for that. John was like that, and Jimmy was the biggest stocky fella. And so I said, no, he went down, he said, um, he, he was shouting, uh, John, don't leave me. And so when he got back on the deck, give his life up for him. Tell him. Jack had experience of working on tankers. I got the Atom Victor. 
and I was told to join the Atom Victor, and she was in uh, Ellesmere Park. And when I got up there, like, uh, there were soldiers everywhere, and he searched it from head to foot for you. She was, she was loading up for the, for the about 8,000 tonnes of high octane, and uh, that was highly inflammable, like. And um, we took that to Belfast first, and uh, she was built for the Swedes, the Athel Victor, and in the accommodation, which is aft, there was a round circle with a lid, and we had a fire suit that you could pull over your hands and face. And we were told never to go out on the deck if she got hit. And, I, and if you did go out on the deck, always go towards the wind, because the flames would be blowing the other way, see. But, you know, that didn't happen in my case. But, that's, but this hole, you were supposed to go down there with your life jacket on. It's only, only about that big. It didn't look big enough to me. And you come out over the propellers underwater, and the ship would still have way on it, and it would leave you. You'd come up, you see, and you'd leave you in the sea, and the, sh the burning ship would go ahead, like that was the tanker drill. We had uh, all the tools were bronze, so they didn't spark. And if you got into warm weather, the... Um, the sprays used to spray the deck to cool her down, like. And she was just a bomb, really. But anyway, I got home from that voyage, and then uh, the next thing out the phone, he said, oh, a tanker man. I said, oh, no, I'm not a tanker man. I, you know. Anyway. <laughs> Len recalls a close shave on a tanker. And then uh, we'd done a second trip, and uh, I was steering the ship in the Gulf of Mexico. Beautiful morning, about five o'clock in the morning, we got torpedo right under the bridge. I was thrown across the bridge, but I don't remember hearing the torpedo go off. My brother was in the cabin down below, and he was jammed in their cabin. One, one chap, he jumped overboard, and I said he felt we lost. And uh, I stayed on that wheel, I think, about eight, nine hours, you know, because other things were going on, and I just left me on the wheel. And we took her up to Mississippi, up the Mississippi to New Orleans. We were there a couple of days, they cut all the plates off, and we all hanging night. Then they sent us back from there. Across to Mobile, Alabama. It's only the one side the ship holding us together. The skipper didn't want to do it, but he had to. And they had one little launch there to escort us across. And then we were three months in Alabama, being repaired, and down to Texas again, load up with gasoline and back home. As we paid off in Swansea, some Bristol boys were coming down in our place, and that, <coughs> that trip she was lost in all hands. She blew up in all hands. Everybody. So really, we were very lucky. Lucky when we got trouble, she never came up and started shelling us the U book, and we were entirely on our own. Still captive in the prison camp, John Hipkin and the boys decide to go on strike, despite the brutality of the regime. The Germans thought that uh, you should mix boys up with men. <laughs> so so they, they, they created a, a boys' barrack, uh, and we were all put into that barrack, and within two nights we'd raided the cookhouse and stolen loaves, loaves of bread. <laughs> it, that was a mistake. You don't put 150 kids together because they do anything. <laughs> and and uh, they, 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 they formed us in working parties so they could keep the boys together and watch over them. And then we found that on a working party in Milag, you got the same damn bread ration yeah. if you were working. As if you weren't. If you were in San Boston on a working party, you got a third of a loaf of bread instead of a quarter of a loaf or a fifth of a loaf of bread. So we were on working gangs and we were not getting any extra bread. So we lined up uh, each morning and each afternoon to go to Spudfields or whatever it was, and we decided to go on strike. And by a sheer fluke, the boys' group was the first one to be approached by the guards to take us out to work. We just refused to move. And we said we'd move when we got a third of a loaf of bread a day uh, instead of the normal ration. Uh, we, if you work, you get more rations. And so they tried other working parties of men. And uh, uh, within about 10 minutes, there was about 40 soldiers from the nearby camp marched into the camp with bayonets fixed. And, and we found out much later that we were very serious, that if we'd not gone out to work that day, the shooting would have started. Every port was a good port, because it might be the last they ever saw. Buenos Aires is often remembered but, as a favourite. The great story of Buenos Aires was the 
the, the DBSs. There were so many ships getting sunk in that that there was hundreds of distressed British seamen. And they were all living on the beach, running wild they were. And uh, they were going in cafes and washing the dishes, anything to get a living, because they had no money. And the council down there wouldn't give them much. Their money had stopped when the ship got sunk, you see. So there was hundreds of... Uh, and every morning, uh, Roman Catholic priests used to come down. It was a very strong Roman Catholic country. And they used to bring sandwiches and coffee, but they had to sing first. And they didn't know the language. So the only words that they spoke were their own principle, like, you know, hallelujah, I'm a bum, and bum you, and all this. And he thought it was good, because he couldn't understand English, and he was made up with his cymbals and his drum. So, so then, they, then they got the, the coffee and the sandwiches, you see. But <laughs> they used to steal the ropes off the ship to burn. They had fires blazing all on the beach. For others, religion and philosophy gave them the power to endure. Well, we have a wonderful hymn called Lord for Tomorrow and Its Needs, I Do Not Pray. Keep me, O Lord, from stain of sin just for today. And that was my philosophy in captivity. Uh, everybody said we'd be home for Christmas in year one. W totally irrational, but we believed it. And then we'd be home for the next Christmas. Uh, and I, I just took captivity a day at a time and, and what you have to do is to develop the power to endure in whatever form it takes and I had a routine I went to mass in the prison camp every morning before I went to to on working parties or uh, if there's no working party because of the weather if it was winter for instance and then I just books were beginning to arrive and and you you build up your own day, which is subject to extraneous things coming up which you don't expect. John spent the rest of the war in captivity. The tide turned in favour of the Allies in 1943, but the Battle of the Atlantic had begun on the very first day of the war, the 3rd of September 1939, and lasted until it ended in Europe on the 8th of May 1945. 5,000 merchant Navy seamen were taken prisoner in the war. Frank describes how the war ended for him. On the Wednesday, the 11th of November, we got liberated. And we got sent down to put on board a ship called the USS Ancon. Yeah. She took um, landing craft out, went in the invading but she, was, she had all landing craft and they done the business, get up there. And we got aboard and the anchor were very good to us. We had Thanksgiving Day on there, somewhere in November. Was it? Yeah. The war was over, 11th November for us, it was over. And uh, we went to uh, Newport, Newport New, Norfolk, Norfolk, Virginia. Got put on the train there, right through to Central Station, New York. And then um, t taken to hotels. Got put on the, we got put on the place. And by Columbus Circle, 57th Street or something. And we put in there, and we were fed. Dick used to give us vouchers of a dollar fifty, could use in the restaurants. And of course, we all had our hair shaved off, and the people knew could have been on the radio about survivors being landed from the battlefront, you know. Couldn't do enough for us, the Yanks. Very good. We got rigged out, the big store, like, say, like Lewis's. Oh, Macy's over there, one them, yeah. Um, three shirts, three sets of underwear, two ties, a suit, shoes, three pairs of socks. Oh, shaving gear, Stetson. I saw him once, you were reporting the Liverpool Express. John Hipkin witnessed the terrible last days of the war when the German boys were thrown into the front line to make their last stand. Just down the road, as I say, the, 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 there was a breakthrough, but before that breakthrough, I looked through the wire and I was looking at the retreating Germans and I was looking at kids 14 and 15 years old in uniforms too big for them, carrying weapons too heavy for them, and they looked so dejected, these kids, but they were the ones who'd been fighting savagely just seven miles down the road 
and they were, I, I felt sorry for those kids. I mean, my war was just about finished. Theirs were about to begin. And uh, this boy soldier thing has stayed with me as well. I, the, the boys in all the armies, wherever I find them, they are of concern to me. And when I find the British government released the court martial papers of the First World War in 1990, 75 years secret, I've discovered four 17-year-old boy soldiers shot by British firing squads at the age of 17. And I, I, it makes me angry, even today, the way boys are used. These were young men, boys really, placed in terrible circumstances for the sake of their country. Did you talk to each other about what you were living no, through? No, 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 no. Um, see, when you were in the sea, say, three or four weeks, at sea, at war time, things were, your mind was always 24 hours on. The U boat never went to sleep. It could come any time of the day. While I'm going from here, down, down below there, it could, it could go down. You're on 24 hour alert in your mind. Your nerves were shattered. In fact, when I did come home, I was living up on the Clyde in the beds. Oh, the woman said you could sleep on the couch, the bed, bed couch it was. That's nice. And then the night I heard noise, I used to get out and climb under, frightened. I tried to walk under bridges. If it was on the, on the drink with one of the Scots, I had to say, walk us home when you're under the bridge. I had a fear someone was going to attack me. Same in the Grafton, you know, things that start like, for no reason at all. And then, but when I went to live with my mum and dad, I used to sleep with my dad. And they say, Dad, someone come upstairs. I can hear, I can, I can act the air. They're not there, I can act the air. Someone breathing heavy. That's the turn off, no one there. He had that fear. But on my discharge book, it didn't say nothing about it. Mr. C just said, uh, discharge at sea, that was all. You know, for poor security. Mm. I crossed that and put a short period. It. For Jack, life turned full circle. Having been forced to go to sea in the war because there was no work in the building trade, now that it was over, there was plenty of employment. I was at sea when it finished, and we heard about the bomb, you know. Yeah. The terrible bomb, like, that it, we couldn't believe it. And we arrived home and uh, it said, all, all the entertainment, like, that the war finishing it over. There was a bit going on still out for the Far East, I think. And um, I'd done another trip, I think. Uh, and then I realised things had changed. So there was a great call then for the building trade. And I married then, you see. I married... I was uh, about 27 then. And um, so I, I come out on what they call B release. And I went into the building trade. And uh, I, you know, I did pretty well in the building trade. That's how it changes. So the world was changing, we had to change with it. John Hipkins' war ended with him all too aware of the sacrifices others had made for his liberation. Something was going on in the barn. Curious that I was, I went over to the barn. And there was a burial party there. There were six or seven fresh graves of British soldiers. They were not left out on the road. But our, my, my freedom was bought by those soldiers. And uh, some wives, some fathers and mothers would get a telegram in a few days' time saying that their son or their husband or their brother had been killed in the closing days of the war. That's... I put a, an in memoriam in news, newspapers for those British soldiers who died liberating us. That was a price of our freedom. Not easy to take. An important part of the veterans' reunion in 2005 was a visit to the memorial dedicated to the Merchant Navy. This is in London, at Trinity Square Gardens, Tower Hill. Hello. 
27% of British merchant crews were Chinese or Indian. 5% were Arab, West African or Afro-Caribbean. 30,000 seamen of the British Merchant Navy lost their lives during the war. In an old Australian homestead With the roses round the door A girl received a letter It came straight from the war With a mother's arms around her she gave forth two sobs and sighs And I, she read that letter The tears rolled from her eyes It was on a cold November morning With a convoy on its way When the lookout spied a radar from off the Jarvis Bay She was only a merchant cruiser Against a pocky battleship But through an oval action They let the convoy sleep All clear the decks for action was the order of the day when gallant Captain Faker he sailed into the fray on the decks lay the dead and dying and for then the day was done but through a gallant action they knew that they had won why do I weep? When I should pray, my love's asleep, so far away, he played his part that November morn, and lost his life upon the Jarvis' face.